Next, we have a couple of presentations. Uh, the first one I imagine we're all eager to see that, that has to do with the comprehensive sustainability plan results of the community visioning survey. And then we have a couple of guests coming in to talk about this. And uh, Stephanie, are you going to introduce this? Or are we going straight straight with our presenters? <laughs> sure, no, I'll introduce uh, really briefly. We're joined tonight and, and thankful for their help all along through the process from VHB, um, which is our consultant who is helping us with all aspects of the conference and sustainability plan. And tonight, Candace Andre and Margaret Tartala are here and are gonna talk to us about um, the, co the community visioning survey, which we have just wrapped up and closed. Thanks, Stephanie. Um, one question, should I share the presentation or is someone else gonna? You have, gonna, you have, I have sharing. Okay. Mm -hmm. okay, so I would just ask to give me one second to get that ready. Um, and then, no problem at all. And welcome also, We're thanks thank for joining you. us. Thank you very much. We're excited to be here. Um, Zoom, we typically use uh, Teams, so it just, it looks a little different um, when I'm trying to open a PowerPoint. We can see it, Candace. Okay. Everyone see it? Okay, great. Thank you. Thank you for your patience. Um, so yes, so thank you, Stephanie. Um, we are excited to be here. Um, just so everyone has um, a little bit of baseline, um, the Hillsborough Comprehensive Sustainability Plan will serve as a framework for achieving the community's vision for growth and development while establishing feasible steps to meet the town's renewable energy goals. So that's really what we're focusing on is, you know, what is viable steps um, for the town. And um, hoping that this will be used to create a healthier, more vibrant and economically competitive community. Um, so today, what we wanted to talk to you about is um, we just finished with our community outreach and um, survey. Um, and so we wanted to share some of that summary with you, um, let you ask any questions you might have, and then give you some next steps for where we're going um, in the next couple months. Um, so first of all, uh, our survey ran from the end of May until about mid-August. Um, we did a lot of outreach um, and I think the key to this outreach um, from the town staff and the town board um, is that it was diverse. So it was on social media, it was in person, um, there were postcards, um, there were bill inserts. And so I think it was a really great opportunity um, to really get as many people, engage as many people as we could throughout the process. 
Um, so I really want to kind of give everyone a high five for this. Um, we had 636 respondents, um, which is about 9% of the Hillsboro population. And just for some perspective, um, we kind of had a team go in our head. We typically say like, if we can get 5% of the population, we're doing really good, um, particularly when it's you know, for a specific plan, and it's not like a community overall survey. Um, we ran a Wake County Transit Plan survey for about the same amount of time about a year and a half ago, and we got about 540 respondents. So if you think about that, that's a, that's a $1 million, I mean, 1 million person um, county, and we got more respondents here than there. Um, and again, I think it, there's a huge shout out that needs to um, be heard because it was really one of those things where when we saw um, the respondents coming in, the town staff um, and board members were willing to kind of pivot and do whatever we thought was um, a good idea to get more people involved. So I really thank everybody. Um, it, it was really a I think a great turnout for the survey. Um, so what, what I wanna share today is just some high level findings. Um, there will be a more detailed narrative summary provided. So if you wanna dig into some more of the survey results, um, that will be available. And we do have all of the spreadsheets where we can query answers from a variety of respondent characteristics. So if you're interested in, you know, how did one neighborhood respond versus the other, we can always query that information and get that information to you. Um, so just let us know if you're interested in that. Um, overall, we had a really large percentage um, of people tagged that they did live in Hillsboro, which we wanted because, you know, it's the town's plan. And so we definitely want people that live there um, to be the majority of the answers. Um, this may this map may look a little small to you guys, but again, we can provide this um, and you can dig into it a little bit. This is um, where we received respond responses from. So of course, the bigger the bubble, the more responses we received. Um, but you can see like, it was pretty widespread, pretty diverse. Um, and then the top two um, neighborhoods that were involved was the historic district in West Hillsboro. Um, we asked a question about what makes Hillsboro a great place to live. And we really wanna make sure that we understand this as a team because um, we do sustainability plans all over the country and they're all different and every town's unique. So we don't want to take something from one town and bring it to your town if it's not going to work. Um, I don't think anybody would be surprised that um, more than half of the respondents um, love the small town feel of Hillsboro. Um, and there was also a lot of information or words regarding natural and scenic areas and really preserving those areas. Um, a couple questions we asked um, about the biggest challenges. One was, what's the biggest challenge currently facing Hillsboro? Um, and that was affordability. One in two respondents said that the biggest challenge is affordability. Um, other challenges that were mentioned for that question were housing options, connectivity and mobility and infrastructure. Um, then we asked a question about the biggest development challenge and that people answered um, very strongly as traffic congestion. Um, other concerns regarding our biggest challenges for development was loss of land and forests for new development, and then lack of sidewalk and greenway connections. So those are kind of things we have in our head that we know are very important to the community and we want to focus on those. 
Um, we then had a round of development preferences. So I'm gonna walk through a couple of these um, and just keep in your mind that this is all, this section was all about future development. Um, so 40% of respondents preferred to see urban development in the commercial and mixed use areas. The question that we asked included um, suburban, general urban, urban center, and urban core. And we combined all of those into kind of one um, summary. So anything that included urban, um, we, we, we bulked together. Um, the most important housing types were single family homes. Accessory dwellings got a lot of interest um, during the survey and then townhomes. And then for commercial development, people were most interested in seeing grocery stores, small retail and restaurants and bars and breweries. Um, we were very excited to see this um, as a sustainability firm. So respondents were asked what characteristics they wanted to see in future commercial and multifamily development. Um, and the top three were actually all revolving around sustainability. So that was, I was very excited to see that. Um, we get into a little bit of trouble with sometimes when communities don't really understand sustainability. And I think the people that we've talked to and heard from so far throughout this process, um, the town's done a great job, particularly with the Clean Energy Pledge, um, really building the town up for this comprehensive sustainability plan. Um, and then some other important characteristics that were included were quality of buildings and adaptive reuse, um, building appearance and connectivity and accessibility. So shifting over to town needs. So from the respondents perspective, what does the town need? And from a transportation standpoint, the most pressing need chosen by the respondents was reducing traffic congestion. So close to 60% of the respondents chose this um, answer. And then expanding sidewalk infrastructure and access was the next most pressing. We had natural resources. Um, and tree and forest preservation was the top choice. Um, natural resources to mitigate climate change was important and then quality of river and wetlands. The respondents chose greenways and trails for um, the most important recreational investment. And then of course, venues for arts and cultural events were also important. And then we had a specific sustainability question um, and the respondents chose land conservation and protection. Of course, we saw again, affordability and cost of living was important. And then the water supply, protecting the water supply. Um, each of these got at least 25% of the respondents for these three issues. Um, one thing that I think is interesting um, to dig into if you have time with the summary is we, some questions we allowed people to answer, to provide more than one answer. So, you know, what are your top three or choose two of your biggest challenges? Um, so that gives you a little more perspective if you have some time to dig into the summary. The last thing I wanna just touch on briefly is the demographics that we saw of the respondents. Um, so typically we use demographic information really to guide our engagement and outreach process. So, you know, it, it doesn't matter. Um, it's not gonna be perfect ever um, from a demographic standpoint. It's, it's, to me, it's what you do to try and get those, these people engaged that we're struggling um, to bring to the table. So one caveat about this section of the survey is it is always voluntary. Um, so people can submit a full survey response and leave these questions off. Um, 
we have found that that works the best because some people are discouraged from answering the survey if they have to include demographic information. So most of the time people complete at least a portion of the demographics, but just keep that in mind as you go through and see um, some of the results. So blue is the town of Hillsborough um, based on the 2019 American Community Survey five-year estimates. So this is the latest um, ACS estimates we can get from the U.S. Census Bureau. So 2019 is the latest we can get. And then yellow is the survey respondent. Um, so typically planners look for a similar percentage, whether it's to the town percentage or county. Um, but what we don't want to see is zero or no representation from a group. And that is what we were seeing at the very beginning of this outreach. And then this is where I'm talking about town staff and the board and the community kind of came together and said, what do we need to do to pivot to bring some um, more people to the table? And that really worked really well. Um, I know Stephanie did a lot of outreach and she's on, on if she wants to add some more information about that. But it's, you know, for us, um, we were really pleased with the demographics of the survey. Um, it still will guide the rest of the process. So, you know, if we see um, a neighborhood that didn't provide any responses um, on the map, you know, our next outreach, um, we may try and figure out how to get that neighborhood more involved. But Overall, we were pleased. We had no zeros anywhere. Um, we got a good range of income. We got a good range of age. Um, so I, I think that it was a really great um, run for this survey. Um, just a couple of next steps so you guys know where we're headed um, in case anyone asks you. Um, so we're really finished with um, the project launch and visioning piece of it, and we're really diving into the individual chapters of the plan. Um, so we'll be meeting with town staff, um, department, facilities, leads. Um, we'll be meeting with um, commissions and boards to really dig in specifically to things like public services, natural systems, the built environment, um, and then um, ultimately, like around April, May, we'll have a draft, which will go back out to the public for a full review of the draft. We'll take in comments and then be able to provide a final draft around June of 2022. Um, so how are we staying engaged? Um, we are totally open to suggestions, um, but what you will probably see next is the piece of information you're seeing on this screen. It's an infographic on the community survey results. Um, we did ask the respondents a question on how they follow the town government the most, and it was through um, the website, emails and social media and so we're really get we're, we work with the public information office and what we're doing is providing them material to really circulate um, through all of the established town platforms um, so this infographic you know anyone could put it on the um, town website or um, Instagram, Facebook, whatever um, the public information office wants to use it for. Um, the website will be updated monthly with some updates since we're going to be kind of in this heads down phase for a couple months just to make sure that people feel like they do know what's going on. Um, and then again, once the draft comes out, um, there'll be another push, a big push for public comment on that draft. 
Um, any questions for me or um, Stephanie? I, I don't know if you can answer while I'm presenting, but I'm happy to answer any questions from the board. Oh, I see several hands. Just thinking maybe if you if you stop sharing your screen, then you'll be able to see everybody. Perfect. <laughs> yeah, I only see two people. Uh, give me just a second. Are you guys still saying, yeah, here we go. Okay, um, do I call out or is this? I think that's, I think that's totally great. We've just okay. discovered in Zoom, it's less awkward if the person presenting just drives the train. So you go okay, right ahead. Perfect. Um, Matt, I'll start with you. You're at the top of my screen. Well, thank you, Candace, And thank you for um, the, um, for the presentation, I think that your commentary definitely enhanced a lot of the slides we'd received in advance. I have a question because as this goes back out to um, people in the community, when we get, um, you know, a plan ready to go and, and get feedback, one of the things that I really want to get your feedback on is how can we increase the diversity of the feedback that we received, meaning the demographic information. I was very excited that we had more, um, you know, I didn't know if the, the 636 was a good number until you said that it's more than you got in all of Wake County with 1.1 million people. But what is um, concerning to me is that, you know, the fact that about 60% of our town um, is white and the remaining 40% um, are minority of some sort of another, um, but 83% of our respondents were white, um, which I think doesn't really reflect a lot of the lived experience. And then, you know, when I look at my own um, background, that doesn't jive. But then also, you know, seeing so many folks who responded who are making 75000 or more a year, which I also think is not very um, representative of our town. And, and then age-wise, I fall into 25 to 34 and, you know, there's a 10% difference between what our town is according to the ACS and then how many folks responded. What, I know we did a lot, but what could we do when we get that feedback um, to ensure that we have a more representative sample at a demographic level um, to help us guide making this decision about what our, um, what our, our community plan is going to be because I definitely want to make sure that it's something that really represents the people that we represent. Yeah, I think that's a great question. Um, I, I think there's, it's hard because there's always this, this hope that you're going to get, you know, a huge increase in um, diverse populations, ages, um, the best way I think that you can do that is um, to some degree what we did with the survey where um, the town had different venues for, um, you know, circulating information about the survey. Um, the surveys tend to, one, not be as interesting to younger people, so you know, either they have survey fatigue or they don't have the time. Um, it's, it's very standard to have that like 45 to 64 age range, super high and younger people and then, you know, much older people lower. So, um, but a couple things, and I think we can talk about this with town staff and we do have a, um, monthly check-in with the public information office. So they've been really great at helping kind of guide some of this. Um, and we haven't talked about this yet with Stephanie, but um, for the plan review, so two things, um, a lot of times 
surveys are not interesting to people. So for the plan review, we may want to do, hopefully, we'll be able to be in person with some things and we can have, you know, some in-person, quick kind of charrette type things that people are interested in. I mean, we talked about this during the survey where we could go to a park or we could go somewhere where there was already people there, an event. Um, one problem, we get a lot of great responses when we go, let's say to like, a, you know, a music event in downtown or um, a festival that's already planned. Um, but a lot of times those people are still your higher income white um, population. Um, you get more people, but it may not be as diverse as you want. Um, a couple other things we've done before is working with um, any type of um, limited English nonprofit organizations, or, you know, if there's some sort of um, sp like Spanish festival, we'll go there. We've done that in Wake County a lot. Um, that's been good. But it, it is really hard work um, that doesn't pan out sometimes with with a project like this, right? Because it's not a tangible digging dirt on my road type of a project. Um, well, let, me, let me jump into Candace. Um, what we learned and the reason that we kept the survey open for three months is that in the first month, uh, when the survey was being distributed primarily electronically, as we saw a very narrow um, to, you know, demographic for the responses. And so keeping it open a lot longer gave us the time then to attend existing nonprofits events and existing organizations in towns that have um, strong community leaders and strong relationships within the different communities. And, and it really comes down to just having the time to go out and meet people and talk to people and to build relationships. And um, so that's, that's what we, that, that's the answer. <laughs> the answer is we're not, we probably won't get a better distribution or of a resp or better response rate electronically. We just have to go out and meet people where they are through institutions that already have strong relationships. And we're really, really lucky in Hillsborough to have a lot of those organizations. So I need to give a shout out to Porch. Um, because they helped us immensely with this survey, letting me attend all of the events through July and August. They gave us volunteers to help hand out surveys, also the Family Success Alliance. Um, we worked through daycare centers, existing churches. Fairview Community Watch was really helpful. Um, and the interns that are working with the Fairview Community Watch, shout out to them. Uh, having surveys available in English and Spanish and having it available in English and Spanish on the website is a, is a must. Um, too. So I guess I'll say that we like we just have to keep building on that, that, you know, which is probably not news to any of you. Um, <laughs> but that, that's how we meet our community, right? We just have to go out and meet people where they are, especially in an era of COVID and Zoom fatigue. Um, it just really is important to, um, to, to meet people face to face and explain why it's important and why their opinions and input matter. Mm -hmm. Matt, does that help? I, I, I mean, I, I certainly think it does. Um, you know, one of the things that, you know, in, in, in my mind, if I had, you know, survey responses based on, you know, demographic information, I would probably just mentally adjust for those, um, the, those responses, because I am thinking about the people who, you know, don't have the time, the luxury to attend this meeting or fill out a survey or it's not top of mind because even before COVID, they've had a lot of things at top of mind and, and a government survey may not be one of those things. So, I mean, I, I hope that as we go through the process um, that we do probably mentally adjust for, you know, where's the source of some of the feedback we're receiving because it, 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 at least on a, on a few demographics, it's not... I mean, there's close and then there's being 20 points off um, in some cases. 
um, in one direction or, you know, 10, 15 points in another direction. So that's just something I'm going to be keeping top of mind um, is, is the source of the feedback um, so that we do have a very equitable, you know, draft plan to go to, to the community. So thank you. It did, it did help. Thank you. Good. And one thing I would just add, and I know I said this during the presentation, but, you know, again, we can query that information. So we can just take, you know, people making less than $50,000 a year and see what those people said. Um, you know, so it's really nice to have that ability in the surveys. Um, the other thing I would say is just, you know, if there is an event that you think would be really well attended, I mean, we are always happy to, you know, talk with you guys and think through, I mean, we've been in people's front yards before talking to neighborhoods. So, um, you know, it just, those type of events aren't like hugely publicized. So it's hard to capture all those. So I would just say, if you hear of something, please reach out to Stephanie and we can certainly, you know, get you, get any information we need to, to bring those people to the table. Uh, Kathleen. Uh, I had very similar concerns uh, as Matt. It, um, my immediate reaction of seeing that 50% of the respondents of 100,000 and uh, it's, it's, I wanted to see, and I still would like to see the breakout of responses uh, ethnically, you know, in terms of minority versus white, but definitely the be below and above 100,000, below and above uh, you know, 40 or 50,000, but um, it does concern me that we could fall into an inadvertent um, trap of being driven by a response that is heavily weighted to those with means over those without. Mm -hmm. And so I think that's something we need to be very mindful um, and certainly Commissioner Hughes has alluded to that. Uh, so that was, he, he did address that, but I would like to see the data broken out much more. Yeah, we can get any of that um, that you want. We can actually, um, we don't typically put that type of information into us, like the survey summary, um, just because it gets really heavy um, with text and tables. Um, but we can certainly, you know, Stephanie, get it to you guys in some sort of a tech memo or something like that where it's broken out. Yeah, no, I would much rather have be, I'd rather have too much information than not enough. And mm -hmm. I appreciate that it may be seen as dry reading, but it's, <laughs> it, it, we're not making good decisions if we're not taking that into consideration. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, and I'll... I'll just add, um, thank, thanks you guys for bringing that, those questions up. We, th this close, this survey just closed about a week and a half ago. So we haven't really had time to dig into all the details. So uh, bear with us over the next couple months, we'll be going into the data and um, we can, we can pull it apart and we can look at what kind of responses are different um, based on different income levels or um, how, you know, people self-reported demographic information. Um, the other thing is that we can rate responses based on, you know, we can weight them. And so, you know, certain demographic populations can be given more weight in order to sort of balance that out over time. But, um, but again, we haven't really had a chance to do that yet. This is just sort of like uh, a snapshot of our initial reactions to the survey, having just closed it about a week and a half ago. No, thank you. And I appreciate it. And I do appreciate the work that's put into this. It's, this is, yeah, it, I, and I'm looking forward to what's coming through in the charrettes. Great. Mark. Yeah, I think the comments of my colleagues are, are right on target and uh, I would be very interested in seeing the data. And also in addition to the charrettes, if you, you know, once you have time to get into the data and, and identify any potential gaps um, in the, the respondents and um, would be welcoming of additional opportunities to get feedback from populations and demographics that we might be missing. So 
uh, I guess I'm saying just keep an open mind about what other opportunities might arise over you know, the next couple of months as they're identified. And then my uh, second question is, um, is there anything about this particular survey process for Hillsborough um, that um, caught your attention or maybe appeared to be missing if compared to the work you do in other towns? Is there anything about our size of town or um, uh, the, the survey mechanism or just anything that sticks out in your mind that we might learn from when we do this uh, the next time? Um, honestly, not yet. Um, like Stephanie said, um, you know, so far I've just been able to see the actual outreach piece. And um, I will tell you, there was zero hesitation by town staff to pivot and put a lot more effort into outreach when we saw, um, you know, not a lot of diverse demographics coming through for the survey. Um, and I honestly, that is what we struggle with with some of our other towns is that they don't want to go through that effort. Um, they're hoping that, you know, you said this was going to work. This is what we're doing. We're going to get whatever results we get. Um, and it's, it really is very, very difficult to do that and get a good response. Um, so, I mean, I think the response numbers speak for themselves to a degree. I know you wish they were more diverse, but, um, and then just seeing all of the outreach um, in the summary narrative, you know, all the outreach, it's listed by numbers. So you'll see, you know, 12 social media postings. A lot of surveys we do, um, the towns want to do maybe two for advertising it and then one at the very end. Um, so I would say that so far, that's the lesson is that you know, Hillsborough has been willing to really dig in and figure out where to go for some of those diverse populations. One of the things that I noticed as the data was coming in is that when um, an or another organization in town that has strong um, relationships and strong membership would share our post, we would get a wave of responses from their you know, from them sharing. And so I do think that that networking is really important. Um, and, you know, luckily we had so many organizations that were willing to do that and also community members that were willing to do that. So as the public information office who really, um, you know, was, was involved in every aspect of the outreach, uh, especially with the electronic survey, um, every time they would send out a, a weekly reminder that the survey was out there, organizations that shared it would then bring in a lot of responses. So that's something I think that we can build on in the future. Uh, Rob. Um, so my colleagues have kind of answered all of my questions and, and Stephanie's filled it in too. So most of all, I just wanted to, to thank you for the presentation tonight and the hard work you've, you've done so far. Super excited about about where we are and getting this moving and, and what the future kind of holds and, and, and what it'll tell us. Um, and I think, you know, spot on in terms of um, we need to, as a town, do a better job of going to the to where people are, um, whether that's through their homeowner associations or through the you know, community groups that, um, that are there. And I think we can, you know, look at um, the survey results and, and kind of target some of those areas where obviously we want to see a little bit more representation. So, um, so really, I just wanted again to, to thank you. Um, I did have one question. I don't know if you said this and I apologize if you had, but um, it, do you know the difference between, so said we initially rolled out when it was a digital sort of heavy um, thing. And then we kind of um, hit the streets and did some more kind of in-person stuff. Is there a breakdown in terms of those, 636 like how many were digital and how many were paper in person um yeah i can probably guess at that because i entered in the paper copies <laughs> so um 
Oh man. I, I mean, I would say it, the paper, co the paper copies were probably between 50 and 70. Um, okay. and then there were some events where we had the electronic survey available for people to fill out, or we were attending the event and driving people towards the electronic survey. So. Awesome. Um, and again, thank you. Uh, this is a challenging, um, activity at any time, but during the pandemic, I know it's um, extra challenging and uh, just getting people to participate is, um, is, is tough. So thank you, we appreciate it. Look forward to, uh, to keep pounding. Well, thank you too. I mean, we, we have really enjoyed working with Hillsboro. We just um, want to be able to like get out and meet people and talk to people. Um, and that's been hard for us to not be able to do that. Um, Mayor Weaver. Thank you so much. Um, awesome presentation. Um, I know that there's much more information to dig into. Um, so, but this is a, a, a great, uh, first sweep. So, uh, it's really informative. Thank you. Um, and I'll just say, echo what my colleagues have said. Thanks for all those great comments and questions. I think we're all kind of on the same track with that. And I, I do think that what um, you all have learned from, you know, how to reach the community in this first round will probably, you know, make the, you know, future iterations, um, you know, even better, I am guessing. Um, and don't be afraid to lean on us, you know, lean on us electeds as far as, you know, taking this out to, to people and places. So um, we're, we're here to be utilized too. I also, I have a, one of the things I was thinking about and looking at some of the results is that in kind of thinking about um, uh, what I understand to be some best practices, future looking practices for sustainability as far as planning and zoning go um, for sustainability. Um, and, you know, some of the survey results not being totally congruent, which is fine. You know, we're looking at, we're looking to see, you know, what the community's interested in and what they want and what, and what they know. And so, uh, you know, part of our job as a board is to be good communicators and have these discussions. And, you know, um, ultimately I think what Matt said is really, really important about, you know, making some adjustments when we're thinking about, you know, whose voice has been loudest. Um, which is not to discount anyone's voice, but we don't want them to be oversized as far as um, populations in the community. So I, just a general question of in this process, is there a place in the process where um, there's, uh, is there something built in, maybe it's in the charrettes, but to you know, help the community understand some things about um, like, single family housing, um, which, um, you know, m might not be the number one thing we want to prioritize, um, mm -hmm. looking into the future, Th things like that, you know, affordability is such a problem yet apartments doesn't, didn't score as one of the most important things that we need. Um, and I know we're not unique in that, mm -hmm. um, as far as communities go, I'm just wondering where that, is there a place for that in this? Yeah, so I think for every plan that's different, I think where we're planning on doing that, so we needed to get through the visioning piece to see, you know, what the community came back with. Um, but what we're planning on doing is um, using presentations to the boards and commissions. Um, we'll also do some, we've done some stakeholder um, contact lists that we want to meet with. Um, and that is where we'll really dig in to some of those questions um, where, you know, okay, in the community visioning survey, we saw this, um, you know, infill development is very important for sustainability for these reasons. Um, and then we would explain like, you know, kind of what infill development can look like if that is a concern for them. But we've been talking to Stephanie and Shannon about, you know, doing these presentations um, at the Parks and Rec Board or the Tourism Board. Um, 
So we already have an established group of people um, and really promoting those from a from the public joining those already open to the public sessions. Um, we've talked about doing some work sessions. So the, the kind of um, pros and cons of different development and things like that will come during those conversations where we're really digging into the chapters. Thank you. Anything else? All right. Well, I appreciate your time. And if anything comes up, please feel free to give me a shout or Stephanie and Stephanie can get the information back to you. Um, but it was so good to see y'all tonight.